This past weekend, Auburn gymnast sustained bilateral knee injuries during her competition. Initially, it certainly looked as if she had broken both of her legs, but we just found out today that while thankfully she didn't have any fractures to the leg, she did have bilateral knee dislocations and multiple ligament injuries requiring surgery. Welcome back everybody. For those new, my name is Brian and I'm a doctor and a sports fan and it's my goal here to combine those two interests to look at different sports injuries and sports medicine topics to try and teach you all a little bit more about what's going on and learn from these situations. Now, right off the bat, I'm not gonna just show a clip of the injury. I don't think it's that useful to just look at it over and over again. We will look at very small pieces of it just to try to explain the mechanism behind what the muscles are doing during an injury like this to explain why it happens. We'll then talk about the important anatomy around the knee that oftentimes people in the news media forget about whenever something like this happens, specifically the nerves and the blood vessels. If you like these videos and wanna see more content similar to this, then hit that subscribe button and let's get started. Everybody's wondering, how does something like this happen? This is crazy. How is this even possible for not only one knee to dislocate, but both knees? To understand that, we need to talk about how those muscles are working whenever someone lands on a jump like this, even in gymnastics. Let's look first at a landing in which someone does not hurt their knee to explain what the different muscles are doing. We'll then take a look at the landing of this injury without showing the whole thing to show the differences in where this might have gone wrong. So here we can see this athlete coming down and they have all this rotational momentum as they're spinning through the air and then coming down to land. The key thing here is right as this athlete lands, you can see that the knee is flexed. Now with all that force coming down on the ground and the knee flexed, that knee wants to move all out of place. It wants to dislocate because of the momentum carrying it through the air. So the first thing inside the knee keeping it from doing it are these ligaments. These ligaments are preventing that movement of the knee, but they're only so strong. They can't maintain an excessive amount of load. And so that's why we see them injured from time to time. But the backup here and the really key function to softening this landing and preventing the injury is also the muscles around the knee. So the two big ones to think about are your quadriceps muscle and your hamstring muscle. Your quadriceps comes around the top of the femur and goes past the knee to insert down on the tibia, and whenever it contracts, it straightens or extends the knee. Now on the back side of the leg, we have the hamstrings, and those also wrap around below the knee, and whenever they contract, they flex or bend the knee up. So these muscles are working synergistically to fire and control the position of the femur relative to the tibia, so that you don't injure yourself when you're landing. Now, if we contrast that to what happened with this Auburn gymnast, whenever she's flying through the air and spinning through the air, she has all this rotational momentum. Whenever she lands, her legs are extended as opposed to being bent. Because her upper body is still rotating forward, that momentum carries her even further forward, pushing the knee back. Because her knee is hyperextending like that, those muscles and the ligaments can't work properly, to stabilize themselves. And so all that momentum and that hyperextension is what causes that tibia to posteriorly dislocate. The fact that it was both sides and not one is just a matter of how she was landing. Based on how you jump and come through the air, both feet are landing at the same time. And so both feet are subjected to that load and that same sort of pattern. Let's talk about our knee anatomy. So here we have the femur, that's the big thigh bone. We have our patella or the kneecap in front the quadriceps tendon connecting the quad muscles down to the kneecap, and then the patellar tendon connecting the patella down to the tibia. Below we have the tibia, which is your big shin bone, and then on the outside here we have the fibula. The key ligaments involved in the structure and stability of the knee. On the inside we have the MCL, or the medial collateral ligament, and on the outside we have the LCL, or the lateral collateral ligament. Those two ligaments are providing that kind of side-to-side -side stability and support in the knee. Next, deep inside the knee, we have the ACL and the PCL, and those two ligaments are providing the kind of forward and backwards movement of the femur and the tibia stability in that sense. Then, of course, inside we have the meniscus, which sort of serve as some cushioning or shock-absorbing features of the knee, and then all the other muscles that surround the knee and are equally important, such as the quadriceps, the hamstring muscles, and even the calf muscles come up and spread across that joint and insert up on the femur. So that's all good. Everybody always knows about the ACL, the PCL, MCL, meniscus, all those, but we forget about the key structures that actually determine safety of this injury when it happens to an athlete. And that's the nerves and the blood vessels we find on the back side of the knee. So the red represents an artery, the blue is a vein, and the yellow is a nerve. So here, this space is called the popliteal fossa. So this big red artery is our popliteal artery. 
It's supplying blood to that lower compartment of the leg, the calf muscles, the muscles controlling our ankle. We then have the popliteal vein that's sending blood back up to the heart. And then this big yellow nerve is the sciatic nerve. It's really big and thick and runs down the back of our leg. It continues down on to become the tibial nerve. And then a piece breaks off and wraps around the fibula. And we call that the common perineal nerve. It goes down and supplies innervation to a lot of the muscles that are important for controlling our ankle and our foot. So while you can have injuries to these ligaments, and you always do in the case of a knee dislocation, what's actually more important to those doctors and the medical team right away is what's happening to these structures, in particular this blood vessel. They're pretty firmly adhered to the backside of the knee. They're not just floating around in the skin. And so if you drastically dislocate or separate this knee joint, then you can have damage and tearing of that blood vessel, and that's what makes this potentially more severe and limb-threatening. If you shear across that blood vessel, you're not getting blood supply and oxygen to those structures below it, and so you can have death to those muscles and sometimes require amputation. Similarly, if you damage this nerve because of a knee dislocation, then you're not gonna have good function in those muscles in the lower leg, you're gonna be dragging your foot, you won't be able to control your toes, and so on. Now for a joint like the knee to dislocate, you typically need three of those four ligaments to be damaged. Often it's the ACL and the PCL, limiting that forward and backward movement, and then one or the other of the MCL or the LCL on the outside. Next time you see something like this happen, don't just think about the ACL, the PCL, the meniscus, all those things that are flashy and you read about on the news. Remember that it's really those key structures behind the knee, like the blood vessel, the nerve, that ultimately doctors are worried about because that's what determines how a person's gonna function and if they might potentially need to have their leg amputated. So that's it for the video. I hope this was educational to teach you guys a little bit about what happens with a knee dislocation, that important anatomy, and then why something like this can happen to an athlete based on those different landing mechanics whenever someone's coming through the air with a gymnastics routine. These same concepts apply to all other sports. So look at the way the athletes are landing, look at the way they're controlling their body when they come through the air, and you'll start to see some consistent patterns with injury risk and development. Thank you as always for watching these videos. Let me know any comments below, questions you have about similar injuries or similar things with this topic. And until next time, thanks for watching and we'll see you later. Bye.